that you can view every person in every seat in every stadium. So you probably have the technology to know who these people are. Is that going to be your goal? Uh, that is a technique that's used very successfully in overseas stadiums. Uh, we've studied it. Uh, we think it will be effective in U.S. stadiums. As regard the uh, the hooligans, and I say they're Class C hooligans, which means they're carrying some kind of a conviction. In other words, they have some kind of a criminal record. If they come to our borders and we're able to successfully identify that criminal record and it fits in with U.S. laws, we will turn them around at the border. Uh, and we are working very closely with a number of foreign police agencies who have cataloged these kind of troublemakers. We will take advantage of that. And let me, let me say this. I don't care if it's an American citizen or a foreign citizen. If they want to come to these games and enjoy the games, they are going to be welcomed with open arms. If they have another motive of coming to these games, they're simply not going to see the game. Okay. Thank you. Paul Kennedy, Soccer America. My question is for Mr. Rothenberg or Mr. Blatter. Um, concerning the development of a pro league, there's been some discussion that the World Cup 94 Organizing Committee and FIFA have an agreement whereby some of the profits from the 94 World Cup will be directed specifically for that purpose. The question is, one, what agreement, if any, is there and what purpose would it be for? The question from Mr. Kennedy is it's his understanding that, uh, that the World Cup Organizing Committee, U.S. Soccer in general, and FIFA have an agreement that some of the, uh, the, the revenue should go toward the funding of a professional league. Uh, is that correct? And if so, what is the agreement? The understanding is that uh, to the extent that there is a surplus from the 1994 World Cup, 30% of it at least. Uh, will be dedicated to supporting professional soccer. Uh, I should also add that uh, the United States Soccer Federation does not view itself as being the entity that ought to be conducting uh, and operating professional soccer in the United States. So whatever monies uh, it may direct, it will do so to support, to create seed money and to support a league once it gets started, but there is no expectation that the U.S. Soccer Federation will actually run uh, the league or own the league. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Rotenberg, can you tell us something uh, about your ideas from for starting a profile league in the States? Uh, I think really we've, we've really uh, covered all we can, and I know it's uh, inadequate, but the fact is uh, we have a work in progress and there isn't anything really uh, specific and meaningful to share at this time. Julie Cart. A question for Mr. Blato. When the World Cup was awarded to the United States, uh, you had hoped in FIFA that <laughs> A professional league it's just no, a professional league would be in place by 1994 now it's possible that one will be in place by 1995 insofar as a, the World Cup was placed here in order to foster a professional league if one is not in place by 1995 will the World Cup be a failure in your view thank you for that question and also for all the other questions concerning this item which is uh, very important for us in FIFA. When uh, FIFA has uh, given or has uh, voted the World Cup uh, to the United States on this 4th of July, 88, there were two uh, objectives. One objective uh, was naturally to stage the World Cup in a wonderful big country. And the second one was also uh, to uh, insist uh, towards the United States Soccer Federation that the second objective is the installment and the creation of a professional league. It has never been said at that time at which date this professional league must work, but it was said with the impact that the World Cup will give and uh, with uh, the very huge community of footballers in this country 
then directly after the World Cup, such a league must start. That's why we have insisted now towards the United States Soccer Federation that our executive committee, our executive board, must be in possession of a project which has been promised uh, by Alan Rottenberg and his group in the December meeting this year in Las Vegas. I have just to add something here, that in our opinion, when in a country, according to different statistics, up to 15 or 16 million people, mostly young people, are playing this game, there must be enough talent and enough force to go with this game, not only into a participant sport, but also to a spectator sport. And with the World Cup, FIFA will offer this window. And we are, uh, let's say, uh, we are confident and we trust our partners here. And they can also count on our help that uh, they and we, we will achieve also this second objective. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I can ask your indulgence for a couple of first-time questioners before I come back to you, uh, let me uh, move ahead to, to you. This is a follow-up question on security. There's been a lot of discussion in Michigan, particularly about the selling of alcoholic beverages in the venues, which I suppose dovetails into the hooligan question. We saw the results in, in Montreal just recently after their Stanley Cup celebration, what can happen when crowds get out of hand. Could uh, some of you discuss uh, the alcohol situation, please? That's another uh, area that we are closely scrutinizing. Uh, there's a lot of controversy and discussion of what is effective. Uh, in all three stadiums where we've practiced our tight security, we've taken a different tack on it. My understanding in this stadium, we are going to ban it. We're closely studying that concept. Uh, there's some degree of a discussion about it's better to provide the alcohol up to a certain point and cut it off so that they don't try to get it on the outside before they come. There's a uh, degree of reasoning that you shouldn't sell it in the stadium. We have tried all three concepts. When we conclude with the U.S. Cup, we'll reanalyze that and we will make a decision before the World Cup whether or not we are going to sell any alcohol. Okay, thank you. Moving across the house into the middle, and then we'll go up to uh, to my right toward the rear. Thanks. This is a three-part question for Mr. Best. If, if trouble broke out inside a stadium, um, what force would you use? What would happen to those arrested, and how close are you working with the English Football Association? We're working uh, very closely with the English Football Association. Uh, within the last month, we attended the match between England and Holland, which we consider probably the highest risk match we could look at. We have closely observed their tactics and techniques. Uh, we have British uh, forces here with us during the U.S. Cup. We're listening very carefully to their sage advice. As far as uh, reaction in these stadiums, uh, I can assure you that there is more than ample uh, emergency response forces, you will not see them, but they will be close by. And frankly, I am, feel very strongly they can handle almost any kind of a situation. Okay. Thank you. We need to move into uh, to this gentleman, yes, with his hand raised. Uh, thank you. My name is Tony Doucette. I'm with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. A uh, question for Mr. Blatter. Uh, according to information provided by the organizing committee, the sizes of the pitches that are going to be used are, some might say, wildly diverse. I wonder if, A, that is unusual, and B, uh, about the relatively tiny size of this particular one uh, in comparison to the others. The organizing committee of FIFA has accepted that in uh, three, uh, in two stadia, there uh, will be uh, a size which will not match the other seven stadia, 
but which still is above uh, the uh, international standard. So you have here the size of 66 meters in width and 103 meters in length. And the international or standard, what we generally ask, are 68 and 105. So they are just two meters which are not according to the FIFA regulations for this World Cup, but I insist still above of the international standard laid down by the laws of the game. Tony, I think afterwards I might be able to clarify uh, what you're referring to if there's been some confusing numbers you've seen. I think I know what you're referring to. Uh, well, yes, over here to, to the left, uh, Okay, let me do, let me do uh, uh, Michelle, and then, we'll, and then we'll pop right back to you. This, this is again for Mr. Best. Uh, I'm Michelle Coff from Detroit Free Press. I'm wondering specifically at the border between Windsor and Detroit, that's my concern. Uh, is anything special being done at the Canadian-U.S. border? And, it, you know, I know you can't tell me exactly what, but is there something people in Detroit will notice when they go through to Windsor or the other way that, that you're doing different lately? Now what, what we do have is we have, uh, as I said before, we have cataloged, or I should say for the international police have cataloged certain troublemakers, both by photograph and complete dossiers. Those are available to us. Those are in the hands of our border officials. And if uh, the individuals attempt to come into the United States who have convictions for van disorder, uh, it's very likely they could be turned around. But uh, the border points are alerted. Uh, the normal people who are coming to the United States shouldn't have any concern whatsoever, however. This is a very subtle technique, yet one that's going to be very effective. As promised, your follow-up. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, uh, okay, we'll, we'll take, take you, and then I do owe this gentleman who's been very patient here, so when you're done, if you can give the microphone down one row. Thank you. Another question to Mr. Best. Don't you think um, it's necessary to build in fences in the stadiums like it's, it's normal in Europe? And if not, why not? Uh, in our recent discussions, particularly in England, uh, the fencing situation seems to be coming down. They're going just the other way. Uh, there is some train of thought that if you start fencing in supporters, you will get a backlash reaction. We don't do that in the United States. Uh, there's other ways that we can get fan segregation. Uh, again, we uh, are looking at different uh, alternatives. Some of our stadiums in certain areas will have fencing. But that decision of whether or not we will uniformly put fencing across our stadiums is open to discussion. We're closely scrutinizing it. I feel rather confident that we can control our fans without them at this point, however. Okay, thank you. I think uh, General Secretary Blatter would like also to comment on that. Yes, a uh, very important one. And um, it is the FIFA policy for uh, the future. You know that uh, we have started already the um, uh, compulsory seating in the stadium for this World Cup preliminary round. We will have for the next World Cup in all stadia where World Cup preliminary rounds will be played after 1994, obviously. Only individual seats like you have here. And this is the only solution to segregate, not fans, but to segregate spectators from hooligans. And the second point is, we do not like fences, and we do not want fences in stadia. If you put spectators behind fences, they behave like the animals, because you put animals behind fences. And in my opinion, it was a very wrong decision uh, to have people behind the fences. And in England, where they have faced most of the problems, the governmental authorities intervened, now in the stadia, you have no more fences in England. And this is the trend and the decision for the future. And then we will have this segregation. We will have football people and football fans in the stadia and not those 
they have other interests to come into a stadium. Okay. Back here, yes, sir. Mr. Best, uh, I have a question for you and then down here to, to Mr. King. First of all, where were the fans turned away, or the hooligans turned away? And then for you and the turf, we're talking about legacy. What about the legacy of the Silver Dome and this turf in terms of other sports being played, say the Detroit Lions, for example, or baseball indoors on grass because of the injury factor? If you could first answer and then Mr. King. The answer was at Logan Airport. What, what no, there was not. No problem. In, when we, we, we faced them with the facts, they were very quietly. We turned them away and sent them back to their country of origin. Okay. Tom? Okay. As, far, as far as the legacy is concerned, obviously we want this field to leave an indelible mark on the sport of soccer. Um, there are several different concepts being considered right now in terms of what will happen with this field after 1994. From the standpoint of professional sports using it on an ongoing basis f for the duration of a season that may last 14 to 16 weeks, at the current time the technology would have to allow for an additional lighting system. The Michigan State experts in East Lansing have proven conclusively that grass can stay alive indoors and be fit for play for the period that we need it to for World Cup. We will play four more games, uh, or excuse me, three more games after the England-Germany game in addition to six practices. We will spread those games out over 11 days. But after that, without artificial lighting, it's conceivable that the quality of the grass would be uh, uh, severely uh, damaged if you do not have additional lighting. This roof only allows 11% of the ultraviolet that's necessary to keep the grass in uh, tip-top condition. As far as the legacy itself is concerned, this field will go back outside for 11 months. It will return to the floor of the Silver Dome in June of 1994 for the big show. We'll play our four games over 11 days, and then what happens to the field, there are several things being kicked around. The field itself is very, very valuable, obviously. It could be sold off. Um, it could be donated to a college program or a high school program. Um, as part of the legacy, or it could even be saved and uh, for the Pontiac Silverdome to submit a successful bid to host perhaps one of the, the venues for the 1996 uh, Olympic Games. So there's a lot of exciting things we can do with this field um, at the conclusion of the 94 Cup. Okay, thank you, Tom. We're uh, beginning to get very tight on time. We've got time for just a couple more, and I have one from Hank Scheller. I'm Hank Scheller from the Oakland Press here in Pontiac, and this question's to Mr. Best as well. Um, the Michigan legislature has passed a bill where during the World Cup next year, downtown Pontiac will be turned into a more or less Mardi Gras situation where downtown storefronts will be turned into bars. This happened during the um, Super Bowl in 1982. I was wondering, do you have any concerns at all regarding possibly uh, in, in the Super Bowl, 150,000 people went downtown during, a, during one week. Do you have any concern about tens of thousands of soccer fans from different companies, co countries possibly mingling together in downtown Pontiac with free and easy alcohol? Yeah, obviously uh, experience has shown us that alcohol and fan disorder uh, are sometimes connected. Uh, we're not enthusiastic about that concept. I'm not sure it's been finalized. Uh, it will uh, provide an additional burden to law enforcement. Okay, yes, we, we'll, take, uh, we'll take two more, maybe three, depending on the timing, but we do have to move uh, off the dais. Yes, sir. Mr. Best, uh, question for Mr. Best. You said that some fans were um, turned back at the airport and that some were apprehended coming to the stadium. Could you be specific on numbers and were they English? I can tell you it was more than one and less than 20. I'm not going to get specific about it, and I'm not going to name the countries of origin at this point. Okay, Roscoe, Nance, USA Today. There. Hmm. My question is for, uh, I'm Roscoe Nance from USA Today. My question is for Alan. You spoke about getting uh, tickets back uh, once construction is reconstruction is done for media seating and 
perhaps from sponsors, any idea of approximately how many you think you'll get back from those areas and how will they be uh, distributed? Uh, no exact uh, number. Uh, I don't want fans who are shut out to get uh, overly uh, enthusiastic because they will not be in vast quantities. Uh, I don't know for sure how they'll be distributed, but presumably it will be similar to what we did with the public sale. That is to say we will uh, run uh, advertisements uh, in newspapers of general circulation and probably on television announcing when and where and how those tickets can be purchased. Uh, and they will either be, again, by phone orders or else out at the Ticketmaster outlets.